we have a pleasure to introduce Eva de Klerz. Uh, she will talk a lot about herself because this is a part of her work. Uh, but uh, you will see why we invited her. And uh, I would like to thank uh, Belgrade Capes Lab because they helped us to, to bring her here to our open lectures on our PhD studies. And uh, you will see that she is doing actually what most of us dream to do for, for a life or living. And she is in that for 20, 30 years, something like that. But I think, <laughs> and I think that you will have um, some questions afterwards. And so let's start. Yeah. My name is Eva de Clare. I'm going to give you a lecture about the city as a framework model which I apply to uh, my work in my projects. I'm a strong believer of bottom-up development, development by the people themselves. And before I go on about the subject, about the case, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. I have studied psychology and communication sciences, but I also had a very I had a serious car accident when I was younger, so I was in hospital for a long time. And after I came out of hospital, it was very difficult, and even in my studies, to go into the mainstream way of life. So it, uh, yeah, I was depressed, I was, uh, you know, very, finding it very difficult to get this, like, status in life. And uh, after a few years of struggling, on my 28th, I went to the mountains in Switzerland and I started herding goats for two years. And the mountain was very steep and uh, you cannot go there by car or by, you know, you had really had to climb up. And I went there with 20 goats and I made cheese and I milked the goats every day. And after two years, it was a two hour walk upstairs. And every 10 days I would bring the cheese down with my donkeys. And when I finished this, I thought, if I can do this, I can do anything I want. <laughs> and then I came back to Amsterdam, and I started working for uh, art initiatives, art uh, artists and art collectives. And I joined a group called the Blind Painters. And actually, my first success was to get um, funding for this huge art project we want to organize in the center of Europe. And um, actually, I think my career started in uh, former Yugoslavia with a train project, an art suitcase project. We started, uh, we exhibit, uh, I joined in when they were going to uh, Belgrade and to Novi Sad. So I've been here exhibiting art pieces on a train. And this was in 1997. And this was the train. We collected railway carriages from each country like from Holland, from Copenhagen, from Greece, from Austria, from Hungary, uh, from you guys, etc., and from the Netherlands. And we asked local artists to participate in the transformation of the railway carriage. So we asked uh, 30 artists from here to transform their own uh, Serbian railway carriage. And uh, we traveled and we had our exhibitions. This was like a container suitcase. And this was like the how we transformed uh, the, the railway carriages into art galleries, moving. And we were always working here for months on, you know, the, you know at the back of the railway uh, stations, and it was very dirty and, and unsafe. And but there was, we had a really good time because we could not afford to pay a hotel or anything. So we'd sit in the trains and we would celebrate parties with the artists and we sort of had these like little subculture events going on there for months, like house parties and big dinners all together. So this was uh, really the starting of my career. But back in the Netherlands, um, of course I met these art collectives in these uh, interesting buildings. And uh, one of these buildings I'm going to explain as a case for my work as an example of my work, and that's the end oh, sorry, that's the end of the shipyard. And this is really about large scale bottom up development. But this came from uh, experiences in smaller scale bottom up projects. So this is where I'm going to take you in. And uh, my motto it's impossible but not undoable to develop cities by people. 
Um, before um, I tell you a little bit about the history, this is the river A um, going through Amsterdam. And the south of the river is the city of Amsterdam. And the north of the river was the industrial zone. And along this river, when all the industrial activities left in 1984, these buildings were they're like 12 big or many, many big empty buildings along the river. And it was really a no-go area. It was very uh, dangerous. There was, uh, you know, prostitutes on the street and there was drugs, criminality, etc. But these buildings were perfect buildings for us to move in as a, an artist to start working there or as a collective of people to start working together on big projects. We had big space. So these are some of the buildings I've been involved with. This is Bakas Vinimina. It's a really great example because I'm going to tell you maybe a little bit of a horror story too. But I want to tell you the success of Bakas Vilamina. This was a building that they uh, squatted early 80s and eventually they managed to buy it themselves because it was owned by the government and they had a really good concept of uh, buying this building themselves and buying it as a collective and uh, self-invest in the building and that the value of the building would always go back to the public, would always go back to the collective and it would be, always be open to the public. So they bought it for one euro and they managed to get a loan for six million euro and they did it all by themselves. And for me this was like a great example. And my former husband, he lived here, so when we were together, we really worked on this building to build our own studios and repair the whole building. So that's the first project. This is the grain silo. Big grain silo, I started also after the blind painters, I started working for site-specific theater. I don't know if you know what that is. Do you know what site-specific theater is? It's a theater that you, that you, you, know, you, you uh, make on the site. You have no concept that you go to a, a rundown area or maybe to a train station or something and there you make up the art piece. You make with the locals, whatever, whatever oh, it inspires you. You uh, make it on the spot. And uh, I was working with Silo Theater in this building there. And these uh, were really great successes of uh, cultural spaces in Amsterdam. These were like the places to go. It was like the Dutch avant-garde, according to foreign newspapers. It attracted a lot of artists from other countries as well. And the funny thing is that in the 80s, when we were all, on, like most of us had a, you know, artists do have a problematic income, but lots of people were unemployed in the 80s. But we found out that when you start working in the building like this, you just occupy a building, you start working together. After five years, nobody was, uh, depending on social welfare, so everybody could find work together. There were so many skills. If you didn't have a skill, you were an excellent uh, baker, you could bake a good cake or make good coffee. You know, everybody would come in with their services, but we managed to sort of create our own little economy within these buildings, and that's really interesting. But um, you can imagine that in the 90s, the early 90s, suddenly the developers and the banks were interested in building this Manhattan along the River A. And they set up this Amsterdam Waterfront Finance Group and they aimed to uh, completely tear down all the old buildings and build a new waterfront. And I'm going to skip a few years, uh, like go up and down, but this was built for the financial district of Amsterdam. But after a while, it turned out that the financial market had no interest in uh, getting office space here. So they built the South Ox, Ox or the South Ax, I don't know if you've heard about this financial district, financial district in the south part of Amsterdam. But they had no interest in developing it here. So it's a very good example how developers create think they're going to buy something for a certain market and eventually it turns out that the market is not interested. But anyway, this is their plans. And also Rem Gohas was one of the people that was allowed to make the master plan. Well, I don't know if you think this looks familiar to you. <laughs> it's the same tower, it's the same, it could be anywhere. But this is how things go. Because of this Amsterdam Waterfront Development Group, we thought we should also set up an organization because we wanted to participate in the city development. We 
had occupied these buildings, but they had also cleaned them and you know refurnished them. We built studios, restaurants, galleries, a skate park, everything we built in ourselves. So we felt we were quite experienced in also developing our own buildings. So we proposed to be part of the city development. Do not kick us down, but let us develop the area together. Let the top-down development exist next to a bottom-up development. Well, this was obviously quite a laugh uh, for the developers. They were like, what, you? You have no experience at all in city development, which we laughed later because they had no market for their plans. Well, anyway, and we did. Um, what, only Pacas Vilhelmina and two other buildings managed to survive in these uh, sort of redevelopment, regeneration of the riverbanks uh, area. And we wrote a book also, uh, well, I'm going a little bit further. Well, before um, Pakas Vindimina was allowed to stay there on the area, we did write a book because we want to participate in city development and we want to show and prove and also theorize why our movements, our approach to uh, taking it into our own hands is successful. It's also an interesting alternative town planning strategy or town planning model. So we set up a think tank with, um, uh, we invited the directors of housing corporations, we invited very important uh, people that, that were good in lobbying within the politics or they had good financial skills. We also invited architects at that time, we invited Lisbeth van der Bol, I don't know if you know her, but she was the, 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 the country's architect for a while, like the Rijksbouwmeester, like every few years you have the architect of your country, and she was appointed that role years later, but she was also part of our workshop, and Lucia Cole and many other architects, and also artists and squatters, and we sat together in a think tank. And we were really thinking of how could we make an alternative model for town planning strategy. And we also wrote a book. We wrote a book about these buildings in Amsterdam who were going to be evicted and the role of the developer in these buildings. But we did not only look at Amsterdam, we also looked at other cities in Northwest Europe to see if there were any similarities. So we went to Dublin, we went to Bristol, we went to Copenhagen, we went to Rostock, etc. So we went to other countries. And we wrote this book, it's Dutch and in English, it's published in 1997, and we started in 1996 with uh, the making of. And it's still actually really uh, crucial at this moment, again, after so many years. <coughs> Sorry. The manifest describes the city as a framework, and the city as a framework, you can imagine these old buildings. They're perfect, you know, old buildings built 100 years ago. They're very strong, they're very sustainable, they're very good, they have good foundation, and you know, they, they, um, and they have perfect measurements. They were maybe one storage spaces or factories or, or whatever, you, but in time you could convert them into atelier, atelier studio space, big high space if you're like a sculpture, etc. So we thought like if you have these old buildings, these very strong, um, yeah, like framework, you know, the basic structure of a building, you could be flexible in the re in the use, you know, inside, you know, the f first storage space, then studios, uh, eventually yuppie apartments, if you're cynical. But this was all about this fame, sustainable structure in which flexi flexible use is possible. And flexible use means according to the demand at that moment. Like maybe at a certain period in life, you need only small studios. Or actually when we started, there was need for big studios, craft studios, like big studios where you could work. There were not so much computers at that time. Now, you would say there's much more uh, demand for smaller or, or collective studios with other sorts of forms. So you can really adjust the inside of a building, but the, the framework is always there. And it's also about the development by the users themselves. It's like, how could you, um, buy a building like this, how could you renovate it, how could you invest in this building? If you start with a little, you know, you can gradually invest in the building. It's like not like developers that instantly put a lot of money in the area and develop a whole city. Now we say you can gradually invest in the building. We can create an interesting climate for people to step in and put in their money and together as a collective we will gradually invest in the building. 
and also the value of the building will go up and will always go back to the people. So that's also one of the, and it's obviously all about uh, facilitating self-initiatives, like really people who want to do it yourself. If you don't want, you know, if you just want your ready-made house, then you're not, uh, you know, then, you, then this is not for you. But there's a lot of people who dream of building their own house or their own studios. And there was quite a lot of people in Amsterdam who liked that, and probably here as well, that really like to build their own thing. And design is completely according to your own demands and what, you know, how you like to see it. And in time, if it's organically, it's like if it's an organic development, you can, you know, you can like, like organically invest, organically develop the building. So it's all about co-investment as so. well. Now these buildings, it takes a while before you get a group. Yeah, because when you squat a building, in the first few years, you get a lot of um, fights, you know, with people coming in and people coming out. So it's very important that these buildings need a period to incubate. They need at least five years to incubate and form a group before they can actually start making serious plans on a building or, being, or taking responsibility. So the city as a framework is also about making agreements together. And this takes time. This is a people's project. You know, cannot demand it on a people want to have a horizontal organization, yeah, they don't want leaders. So you have to know that this takes time. And it's also about how you could create uh, partnerships. Like you can, you, you always need an architect at a certain point to translate your dreams and your plans into building permission because mostly you do need a building permission. I haven't studied architecture and these big book of rules, you know, I, I can't even read them, so I really need an architecture. But you can also be part, uh, you can, it's all about getting partners, and even if you want to participate with a housing corporation, or maybe even a developer, it's about that you're all equal partners, and either you invest time, but you can also invest services into this uh, community, or actually it's maybe, um, yeah, a cooperative, uh, or I don't really know, the maatschappij, I don't need this. Know the proper uh, translation, maybe. Yeah, you could even see it as an investment fund, with just one fund per building in that way. Despite the book and the plans and the manifest, and that Bakas Vilhelmina managed, one of two buildings managed to uh, not get evicted, most other buildings got evicted, and that meant that 1,200 people young people, artists, people just starting their businesses, entrepreneurs, but also skateboarders that had built one of the most successful skate parks in, uh, or there was no indoor skate park in Amsterdam, but they built it themselves. They were ev evicted. <coughs> and there was a lot of demonstrations because the Amsterdam was also getting so expensive. And there, these um, initiatives were so popular also in the arts and at the academies and people were putting their exhibitions in. So, and it's also like it took so much time in this incubation period to set up a network to work together. It's such a complex uh, thing. It's like, like, like a watch, the inside of a watch. It's so complex how you've managed to build that up. So uh, in the 1998, uh, the government decided to evict most of these buildings and there were big, big riots, or riots, and big demonstrations. And at the same time, um, our city invited, or every four years, our city invites a cultural criticaster or you know, someone from another country to give a cultural comment, or give a comment on the cultural climate of Amsterdam. And this time it was Trevor Davis who came to from Copenhagen, who was asked by our government to give, a, a, you know, like to give uh, his opinion about the cultural climate in Amsterdam. And happily enough, he was the patronage of the train project, so we knew him very well. And um, he was writing about Amsterdam and saying Amsterdam is really losing it. It's only focusing on the consuming of art, on the big museums, the high rise, only on profit development. <laughs> and that it was kicking the most important group out, you know, the young people, the starters, the low incomes, and also the, the humus layer of the industry, of the creative industry. If you have not a, a subcultural scene or 
it will not feed other countries, other businesses you want to attract to Amsterdam. And that also Amsterdam is losing its tolerant image and its attraction, and that it was always liberal and free and experimental, and this contra image of Amsterdam. So there was a lot of critique, foreign critique, on the city policy of Amsterdam. Also at the same time, we wrote a letter to the government um, with all the 12 buildings, we wrote a long letter, but there was a hearing in, in the government. But we got a lot of support also from other institutes like the universities, the, the academies, the pop institute, like the, the more institutionalized organizations also had the same problem. They also couldn't pay for the space where they were having their, uh, you know, doing their schools and educations. So this was a big, big problem at the moment, but we managed to open up. And at the same time, of course, we were sort of like uh, at the train station, at the airport, putting up posters, do not travel to Amsterdam, it's fucking boring. And it's still boring. It's getting there again, so I'm going to have this story, and then it's going to be really great, and then it's going to go down again. But anyway, this happened uh, in 1998. So we got evicted. And I was in the Silo Theatre and I was looking across the River A and I looked to the north and I was uh, I, I once went to this really beautiful uh, performance of Dochtrup. Dochtrup is one of the most famous site-specific theatre groups in Europe at that time. It doesn't exist anymore. But they had this wonderful performance at the NDSM Wharf in the north. And uh, I went there and I was so fascinated about the area. It was like a really no-go area that when I came back I thought I'm going to do something. I really wanted, I'm going to squat it. I'm going to find out uh, who it is, who it belongs to. <coughs> and this is the NUSM. It's like an old ship, uh, yeah, ship building and dock wharf. It was uh, deserted since 1984 and it was very criminalized, and very dirty, and it seemed quite far away. If, if you go with a ferry, you take a bike, it's only 20 minutes psychologically. It was very far away because you went through this horrible sort of industrial area where nothing was happening so people would feel unsafe uh, to go there on their bikes. And this is like the area, this, this is the, with all the uh, little windows, the biggest building actually, as you see. This is the building I'm actually uh, uh, talking about, which the uh, story is about. And this is the whole NDSM. This is already later, this was not in the time because I didn't have a picture at that time. And it was so deserted, this is only a few years ago. But just to give you an, an idea of the whole area, there's still some ship dock activity back there, etc. And there's a whole um, village built for factory workers behind it. It's one of the most poorest neighborhoods of the Netherlands, just behind it. Oh, sorry. And here you can see how the ships were built, like the really big ships, and the warehouse would be this small compared to the huge ships which they built. And the thing is that the city government wanted to tear all this down, all these beautiful old buildings, all this history about our very well-known and famous shipbuilding history, they just wanted to tear it down to create this really high-rise Manhattan development. And here is the shipbuilding warehouse inside, as you can see it was totally deserted and it was actually falling apart. And here I started uh, thinking, well, maybe I should squat the area, I should go there. And I was asking, I was looking at whom with, with whom would I like to do it and I approached the skate park because I really like skateboarding, my ex-husband build skateboards, my son is a skateboarder. In my work, I was always working next to the skate park and always had exhibitions there. And I was really so angry that they evicted the skate park, like an initiative by young kids who built everything themselves. It was so successful that even the rich people from the south would come and drop their children off there and there would be always foreign skaters and really good. So I was really annoyed and such a loss of capital, such a it destroyed so much capital for the skateboarders. So I asked the skateboarders, would you be interested in going to the north? Yeah, 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 great. And I also had a, a few friends, mothers, that were unemployed mothers, and they had specialized themselves in uh, building with recycled materials. Uh, and uh, one of their most favorite materials was straw bales. 
Do you know what straw bales is? Someone knows at the back who can translate it. You know straw bales? Like the, the, the dry grass that you cut the... Yeah? Yeah, you really compress it, yeah. And she had, she was, had, had experienced it, had, had learned to build with straw bales, which is a very popular building method, for example, in the United States. And she was building orphanages in uh, Romania, South Africa, you know, with these recycled materials. And she had this wonderful dream to build a restaurant out of straw bales for kids on the other side, you know, like on the, on the, not in the north, but on the other side of the river. But people would not take her serious. Like you, you're an unemployed mother, and less is, and also an escape or what you, you're kids from the street. You're not business people. We're not gonna take you serious. So for me, it was like because I really knew how good they were, I really knew how good the skate park was. I thought if we go to the north, I wanna set up a place, like build a city and build our own city with things that cannot happen anywhere else, which you know people don't understand. And this is sort of uh, starting with just a table in front of the door and talking about it. This is actually Anna from Belgrade, who was on the Belgrade exhibit. She was visited us in 2000. She wrote about it as well. But this is how we sort of got thin I am. And then uh, suddenly, uh, the, 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 in, the, in, in the national newspaper, there was an advertisement that the district authority, like the local government, we have all districts in Amsterdam, and the dist North District it has its own um, um, uh, authority and to, for the, from the government, uh, who owned the building, set up a competition, and was looking for a cultural entrepreneur to redevelop the area for a period of five years. And I was sort of fed up with squatting and moving from one building to the other, you always build something, you invest, and then you have to break it down, then you have to invest again. So at a certain point, I felt it's time to do it legally. So I want to enter the competition. So I wrote this plan with the skateboarders and the mothers. And actually, the skateboarders, they crowdfunded money. And all of us did with our parents, our grandparents. And you go to a bar, you meet someone, and you have this great idea, do you want to have, make a donation? We managed, within two weeks, we managed to get a few thousand uh, euros in order that we could make a, a produce a plan, we asked architects on no cure, no pay base to work with us and also financial experts or other people we thought we needed to make a good uh, competition entry, to make a good plan. So with the money, we could finance, for example, this plan. It was very handy. Now it's very, you know, it's used now, but when it was just finished, it was very beautiful. And we uh, produced like 50 of these really big, it was this big, so it would not fit into any drawers. It would not fit into cupboards. It would always stick out and irritate. You cannot, you know, you cannot overlook it. So we deliberately made it very big and handcrafted by an artist. And we made 50 of them and distributed them all over the city, not only in the North District, but all over in the city, especially at the city council. We evicted all these buildings and we wrote a plan on how we're going to build our city according to the city as a framework model. But we are going to build our own framework with an old framework and we're going to build, design and finance our own city. And we entered this with the, and we had this big map of letter of recommendations from all these directors of all these institutions in Amsterdam and we made a big model. So we, that's where we spent the money and too much of our, oh sorry, too much of our surprise, uh, we won the competition. There was like 140 uh, applications, but actually nobody wrote a total concept. And we were the only one to write a total concept, concept for a big warehouse of about 20,000 uh, 20, square meter. And it was 19 or 25 meters high. So it was quite a big project, but we wrote a total concept for it. But what did we win? This is what we won. We won a warehouse this big, but it was a complete ruin. It was polluted. It had no roof. There was no electricity. There was no toilets. There was not even the sewage going there to, 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 to make toilets on it. And the lack of maintenance of the building was eight million. We had nothing. And we only had five years. So, uh, and the, so they said, okay, you are the only one that is allowed to make a feasibility plan. 
because you can imagine that uh, you win a prize and you want to show that it's feasible in the market. That was like you, you had to do it. So we won the feasibility plan. Oh no, we made the feasibility plan. Now I managed to get a little bit of money to pay for the architect, to pay for the people that helped us on no cure, no pay uh, base. So we made a feasibility plan, which is this one. And uh, the conclusion of this feasibility plan was it's not feasible. Mm -hmm. You know, in five years it's polluted grounds. We have this big program of building 250 studios with 500 people. We're going to program, we're going to organize festivals, we're going to experiment with fire and etc. We're going to build a skate park. But, you know, it's, it's impossible to even, like, before you have your first hole in the ground as an architect, you know, it takes you five, six years with polluted area, etc. And um, so it was not feasible. And I, then we lobbied to get a contract, say, oh, then I said, okay, if we can buy it, like Pagas Vilhelmina, the warehouse Vilhelmina I mentioned before, who managed to buy it, then we can go to a bank and we can make it feasible, because then we can have a lease for 50 or 100 years, because the city doesn't sell the land, but he leases the land. And we could have, but no, no, they didn't want to sell it. Because, uh, yeah, you know, it's a temporary project, and who are you, etc., etc. So, um, they, but they did eventually give us a 10 year contract. And as we were making the feasibility plan, there was also a lot of support, or not really support, but there was some uh, concern from the, from the villages back behind the NESM wharf, behind you know, the towns I showed you. The factory workers were very annoyed that they heard that the government or the district authority was going to tear their buildings down. So they managed to lobby that the buildings would get a monumental status. So it would not be torn down. It could not be torn down. So with that happening, and we got the monumental sta status, thanks to the old factory workers, we managed to eventually get a lease for 25 years. So with this plan, I calculated, feasibility plan, it's 30 million euro, 3 0, and that we, 500 poor people, artists, skateboarders, can account for 20 million euro, and that is 10 million euro uh, of our own money and effort and time and services, which you need. And we could, because we also pay rent, because we had to rent the building, pay rent, with the rent, we could get a loan of 10 million. And we were 500 people, and that's a big group. That was our calculation. But because we couldn't buy, we, we lacked, we didn't have enough, like it was 30 million, 20, like 8 million short. That was the lack of maintenance. And so I lobbied for, uh, for the 8 million. And actually, I won a prize with the group, the Kinex North group. That we were uh, the most, uh, we were the most innovative example project of the Netherlands because we were doing something which had not happened before. We were doing something which did not fit within the building regulations. There was no law for it, and we also were such a big group. It was very, it was like innovative, like a big group could commission several building projects, and also because now we had a monumental status, I want to have a sustainable energy system. So be actually completely self-sufficient in our energy needs. So this was way back in 2000. And I won a prize. And there was some other, uh, an other the city, the center city wanted to have in certain no-go areas. They want to have like youth centers, like in the north, in the far southeast, in the new west. They were like the most unpopular place to go. So but because I was there with the skate park, they said, maybe you want to be the start of this youth cluster. And they provided us with money to build a floor for, you know, just one layer for the skate park to be built on. And eventually I managed to lobby for the rest from the city government uh, because we needed affordable working space because there was so much a demonstration also by the institutions that the rents were so high that they set up a fund to create affordable working spaces. So we managed eventually to get everything nicely organized and have a contract. And then I said, okay, great, now we know it's feasible, we know we can do it, we can know it, and then I, and everyone was happy, and the government, blah, blah, and then I threw all the plans away. Because my um, belief is, it's first the people, and then the design. So while it was still a ruin, we just moved in. 
with, you know, we all drew a chalk line on the ground because we had no money to start. So we, I said, okay, if you want to be part of the project, you can come in. We draw a chalk line on the ground. Everybody who wanted to be part of the project had to pay. Not much, but you had to pay. Say, uh, 12 euro per square meter. So if you want 10 square meter, you know, it's like 12 meters per, per year, and per month. So in that way, um, 70 organizations moved in within the chalk line and we managed to get a little bit of money to start paying a little organization. And um, because we didn't have all the subsidies yet. To start off with, and uh, this is how it looked like in the beginning, and this was actually a really fun part. So in the ruin, we built a little village already with no, you know, no plan, no grid, nothing. There were no toilets, no, still no toilets there. I don't know how we managed thinking back. Yeah, <laughs> three toilets we had. Yeah. <clears throat> so this was like the beginning, just first the people in, and then we're going to start designing it. And it will take us a few years to get the building permission, but at least we're there, and we can promote it, we can attract other people, and we can show that we're serious. We are in there, and, we, and we signed the contract also to rent the place, so we could also pay rent to the government and district authority. And then we started workshopping. In 2001, we um, uh, set up a work, uh, like a workshop group, not of all 70 people, but say like 12 people who were really interested in uh, being part of the design group. And we workshopped together and we invited a philosopher, an architect, but we also thought it would be very smart to invite an urban planner from the city. Because, you know, we are a building in a whole area, so it would be good to invite also an urban planner. And uh, we were inspired, uh, uh, like first you have this building and you start to observe and what does it look like, you have these stones, it was a very bad neighborhood, like everybody thought we were crazy that we were going to start there. So we observed first the place and then we started sort of associating and looking for the soul. And we were inspired by two artists eventually, about Constant Neuhaus. He's the Cobra artist, um, he was like uh, the new Babylon theory, the homo ludens, building decks, in, and also about Louis Leroy, who's an uh, old man still alive in the north of Holland, who builds beautiful gardens out of rubbish. Like everything you want to get rid of, all old stones and pavements and stuff, you just drop them there. Also the, the cities or, or little villages drop their garbage there. He can build beautiful gardens because it was so polluted, it was so... Uh, dirty and everybody put their junk at the NBSM. So uh, this was like our two soulmates for to, to sort of think about how we are going to design the city. And also we looked at you know the, 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 the how the windows go and how the cranes go and how the railway tracks go on the earth and what the entrance does and there's an entrance here. So we really looked at it was not sort of like we just do it. So we really make a grid together with you know like a city grid with the whole warehouse. And then we came to this sort of simple um, construction. We uh, designated five building projects. And this was also um, the start of getting organized because um, our experience in the other buildings before, you know, our experience, you should have not too many people involved in the project, otherwise it will not work. So a limit of 100 people and not too many, otherwise you will never get enough finances. So there has to be this sort of critical mass which enables you to finance and invest in your own building. So we thought with 500 people it will never work. So you need to make five building projects, sort of see this five buildings in one building and organize it that way. And the workshop itself organized itself with the youth people wanting to go there underneath the skate park and then the free zone, the free, yeah, kavels, it means the free zones that were for, for the more, uh, you know, people that didn't want to be part of the community and they just want to have their own building permissions and they didn't want to go to meetings. So we thought, well, there's also people that don't want to be part of anything. Let's give them the free zone. They can be responsible for their own process there. And then we had the east wing, which was a lower part of the warehouse, only eight meters high, which was uh, all the theater groups and circus and special effects and big puppet theaters, the site-specific theaters, they had something in common to occupy or to, to, to ask for the East Wing because they had that outdoor space which you can put stuff outside 
and they want, and they could have the same sort of electricity needs that they needed more more power than normal uh, studio spaces needed. So they sort of yeah, put themselves in the East Wing. And then the Kunstan, which means art city in the middle, it's actually layers of small studio spaces. You know, for on the bottom on the ground floor, a little bit higher and bigger for the crafts, the woodworkers and the machines, etc. But how, how, how higher you get, how smaller and you know better and, and easier the, the, the units are for people, architects, writers, photographers, painters, uh, designers, web designers, industries, etc. <coughs> then we all put our building workshop and our business plan because how are we going to prove ourselves in the market? If we put it in an operational plan, yeah, we had to make a lot of plans to make sure that people trusted us, but okay, we make another plan. And we made, this is the operational plan, this is our Bible. Here are all the projects in, all the building projects already designated. They all have their own budget. We selected our architects, we did not have one architect, we selected many architects. Each project actually has its own architect. In the free zone, there the people are their own architects. And, um, and we put all, everything here in the operational plan and also the 10-year budget. And then we thought, well, this is an exercise you have to do for three years. You know, we, and we also have to go back to our work. Let's hire our manager who can execute this project. This, this is the book he has to stick to according to the rules. And all the rules that we made and the agreements we made together in the book. And we hired a general manager to exercise this. And this is the first, the East Wing. You see it's sort of like, it was completely open, but we uh, cleaned the floor, got the pollution out, and we built fundings, like, like there are 12 um, beuken, what we call compartments, empty compartments, but we put uh, holes in the ground so it could fund, be the foundation of a, a heavy uh, wall and construction. But only that, and then these companies all went in and built their walls together with the neighbors, and here the facade and at the back, it's all their own, uh, in, yeah, building it in themselves. It's their own money and even their own labor. So the labor we also estimated, so that's 10 million, you know, whatever. It's one million was this project of own investment. This was the design for the skate park, which was designed for the skate park and it really got built. And in 2005, we opened the skate park. And this, in the years, has turned out to be the only skate park in the Netherlands that doesn't get subsidy for their organization, that has 11 employed people in their organization, can pay rent, not in the first years. Of course, they didn't have to pay rent in the first years. But because they grew and grew and grew, they were eventually, after a few years, were able to pay like 70,000 euros, which is a lot. But they were very successful, and they were top-rated skate park in Europe. Here is the framework. You see this literal framework of uh, this design. This was like we had two uh, sort of moments. That first, it was difficult to get the building permission for the whole infrastructure of the building because it never existed before, and that's why we got the prize from the, the national, you know, the country, because we were doing something where then there was no rules. So it took us quite a while to get the building permission for the infrastructure, the fire machines, etc., etc. It took, a, took us one half year, and it was accepted unchanged. So that was we were able to, to select quite a very good uh, companies. And the second was that we uh, asked for a building permission uh, only on a city grid like this, with no end image, because actually our you know, organic development is also without an end image, it's an open end. So we, uh, so this also has never been done before, yet you apply for a building permit to just build a framework in which you promise that everything will be built within the, the safe, within the building regulations. And they check afterwards, so uh, it was not even for us to organize and control if everybody's sticking to the rules. The government does it afterwards anyway. That was smart. And here you can see how we built, everybody built their own studios within the framework. So we had certain rules. You were not allowed to have more than 100 square meter per person. And if you wanted to have more, because you were a big group or a big collective, if one of you moves, you have to build back a wall again. 
So this was like, uh, and here you can see how, and this is like 120 studios. We're only halfway there. 120 studios, 250 people have now invested 10 million of their own money into a project. And they're not rich. They're really not rich. We can hardly survive. But we managed to do this. I mean, you can only do this once, you understand that. <laughs> yeah. In your life. This is my office. I put three containers in. And you can take them in and out. So I'm a true city as a framework believer, as you can see. And it's like when your contract ends, you can take it out. You can take it with you. So well, most people might want to stay. But if you want to go out, especially like windows, and doors are really expensive, so if you move, you can take them out again and uh, leave it to the next person to finish. This is also from the most popular and most photographed angle in the warehouse. You also see we have a diagonal. We want to create an, a connection between the front door and the back door, which is a diagonal. And this we call the Broadway. And behind the Broadway, you have Times Square, and there's Times Square there. <laughs> so we were inspired also by the windows. You see the light are on the streets so the lights would fall in to the windows and the cranes, etc. <coughs> we were awarded a prize in 2007-2008. We were on the cover of the Yearbook of Architecture, which was great. You know, we never planned to be successful. We just wanted to be a functional, cheap, uh, self-built city, and uh, but we were. Uh, we, we, were, we had a great a critique on this was like pure, pure architecture that you build something which the people can really put everything and build everything in according to their needs. So this was... Uh, and this is the restaurant of the unemployed mothers. They, um, they built, they, they designed a, a, a beautiful building out of straw bills, but they didn't get a building permission. Because uh, not because it's unsafe. A straw build, uh, building is one of the safest, safest way to build. If you, if you put open fire on a straw bill, it will not burn. Uh, it takes a while. It will smoke, of course, but it will not burn. But they, uh, the government, the the, the the department where you apply for your build, building permit, said uh, it's not industrial enough. And this is like a temporary, like we are temporary uh, project. So. What we did that she built a, a, a kitchen and toilets out of straw bales and we found this lying somewhere else and we put that over the straw bale house and we filled it up with sort of this plastic glass which is not really sustainable but um, in that way it was industrial enough and this is now um, one of the top 25 restaurants in Amsterdam. <laughs> and she's not unemployed anymore. She's giving labor to so many young people. It's amazing. And that's because she's really, she loves her work. She loves to build. She really takes care of the garden. She really loves uh, healthy, veg uh, uh, healthy cooking, etc. And of course, it's a lovely area, which, which we, nobody liked before. You cannot understand why. Well, these are the costs. I will not bore you with them. It's like 30 million. I'd already explained. Two thirds is financed by us. One third we managed to get subsidy for. If we could have bought it ourselves, we could have. Uh, we could have done it without subsidy. I promise you. It's also a place for festivals, and also according to the city as a framework model. There's also. <coughs> sorry. There's also, like, what do you do with the outside space, with the outdoor space? You can imagine the MUSM is now, many of these buildings that all have different owners. But how do, we, how do we organize ourselves for the outdoor area? And this, therefore, we set up a separate foundation to manage and program the outdoor area. Which, um, so that's also interesting to... Uh, think about also in our <coughs> warehouse, you have these five building projects that all are responsible for their own building project, but we have another foundation that's responsible for the, the whole and the outdoor area between the studios as well. So this is an interesting way of how to get organized 
together. And also the government is part of the foundation too, because it's responsible for outdoor space and safety, etc. But also the owners of the buildings, and it's really interesting to do that that way. Of course, we are getting a lot of attention <coughs> abroad in der Spiegel, the Kudostädte. We were like getting like every uh, big magazine. Only uh, two years ago, one year ago, the New York Financial Times wrote about us that we are um, in the list of five most interesting places in the world to see. So it's um, quite amazing that it's such a successful project. But as you can imagine, because of the success, all these wolves are, client, are sort of walking around us and all these developers are... Um, this was 2007, uh, just before, <coughs> just like from 2000, with this big, big economic bubble and everybody was building and, and frauding with, with building stuff and etc. And then the developers wanted to buy the whole NDSN area. And you remember I told you that we hired a uh, managing director mm -hmm. to exercise the operational plan? remember? He was very expensive. And we couldn't pay him. So the government said, okay, you pay half of his salary. And, and he was also an old uh, civil servant, or he was actually the former managing director of the, the urban planning department of Amsterdam, or the city development planning. But we, then I was pregnant, and well, I thought it was great. So we hired him. As a, as a director, and um, we never formalized ourselves because also uh, we, we had to set up a foundation. We were first a working group, Kinetic North, Kinetic, Kinetic North. I don't know if you know anything about Utot is Utot and Ukin. I will not uh, bore you with uh, uh, science, natural science. Uh, the managing director. Um, was supposed to do the plan and he was asked to, like we had all the finances sorted in our 10 year budget. We had the building money, we had the programming money, but we didn't have the, like the first five years, we would have a debt of a half a million because we could not rent from day one. You know, it takes five years to exercise all the projects and get the rent. So he was actually asked to, 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 to do the whole project, exercise it, and also make sure that we find some way of pre-financing of the first five years. Now, he did not do anything. He, uh, we didn't see it for the first year because we sort of looked up to him. You know, we thought, who are we? And he's like, really, this man, manager of everything. And uh, he was uh, not doing uh, stuff according to our operational plan. So he was building projects which there was no, building something where there was no there was no, it was not accounted for because we had divided, really strictly divided our money into building projects and already commissioned architects to work on the building permits for us. We started getting real expensive people in the organization while we knew we had a little bit of money just to pay him. And he was started buying artwork and it, it, it turned out that he was just divorced. He had this mistress with really bright red curly hair and NSM is becoming popular and he really thought he was the art pope and the first thing he did, he ordered a press photographer and put himself like this on all the papers and, and this was like a guy, you know, this crazy guy and he did not do, and within two years he created a debt of two million euros because he didn't stick to our plans. And he had no budget control. <laughs> yeah? And so now, to, uh, I didn't talk about the problems, but I've got them. I saved that for you guys here. <laughs> and because he was he making such a mess, and we didn't, and we had to, because we had to set up a foundation, when we got the subsidy, they said, okay, we give you the subsidy, but you have to be a legal body. You have to be a foundation, but we want our board to be external people of importance. So we never formalized our own positions in our own or in our own project, our own organization. We were just so happy and so naive, and we were like, the the, the government is our natural partner. We're going to work together. We wrote the operational plan together. It's the Bible. All everybody who gave us money said, if you stick to your operational plan, then it's okay. If you don't stick to it, you have to give it back. 
you know, like that. And he fucked up completely. <laughs> Two million euros, he had a serious problem. And what he did without us knowing it, he was selling the warehouse to a developer. Just after we invested 10 million euro of our own money into the project. So when the city as a framework opened, you know, the, when the, the framework inside with all the studios, they opened, we found out So our opening party was like, uh, everybody was there, all these really important people, and we just, you know, really accused all of them of, of fucking with us and such as, it was not a party at all, and uh, it was supposed to be the prestigious city of Amsterdam party. So since then, it was very difficult. And we, and, this, the, and, and, and he was trying to sell, and because also he was working for the government, and his friend was the mayor of the district authority in the north. Because obviously the mayor of the district authority in the north had also failed that he could make such a big mistake. So they became friends, so they together decided, well, maybe the solution is to sell the warehouse, and then we sell it for 5.7, and, and you know, everything is okay. And we didn't know about this. So when we heard about this, they were already negotiating for two years. I asked, can I also put in a bid? You know, I also want to be, maybe be asked to buy it. Why is it all under the table? And they said, okay, you have two weeks. It is, of course, crazy. And still so naive that I was. So I asked the board of the warehouse Wilhelmina that bought it. You know, they have all these people and venture capitalists and asked them to help me. And it turned out that we could pay 6.4 million instead of 5.7. And, uh, but they didn't accept the bidding. And our group was obviously so big, although we were just trying to divide ourselves in five organizations, suddenly everybody felt that we should unite and all be one against the enemy. So they lost track of setting up their own organization. And then we became like this big group and also fighting and blaming each other for it and the, and the government and the government was saying, oh, see, we, you cannot buy it yourself, or you're only fighting. So it's just, just horrible instead of looking at our bid and say, wow, what a great plan. Because the developer only put in a paper and said, oh, I'm going to pay 5.7, I'm going to work with this company and I'm going to do it like that. And this company was already going bankrupt, so it was really strange. But anyway, we can ask about this later. But this was horrible. And this is the protest, the principal, this developer is going away with our capital, capital, principal, capital, is going away with our capital and all wants to be. <coughs> but uh, the crisis in 2008, uh, so the, the, the selling didn't uh, go on. So the, well, our, our building was not sold to a developer, but uh, we were stopped to develop it any further because our foundation had just been ripped apart. Uh, uh, the former director and the mayor of the city hall decided to, to get rid of all our board members and put new members in and they were all, each member was part of a different political party because it turned out to be that NSM is like the place now where future development like waterfront development has to happen. And they're going to earn lots and lots of money. So they want, don't want us to develop any further. They just want, actually, they want us out now. And um, but now this uh, last year, um, the developer of the NDSM, uh, a quarter of them went bankrupt too, and they're actually not managing to develop anything at the NDSM. Or, so we're in this sort of still fighting and still sort of where are we now uh, mode for the last seven years, and nothing is actually happening. So in the meantime, I thought, oh, I'm sick and tired of it. I cannot uh, talk to all these people. Oh, I'm going to start another project. And I was trying to set up my own energy company at the NDSM within the warehouse. But because of all this buying or selling to a developer and the artist inside, not, not really getting organized together, they need time again to recuperate. And, and they didn't want to set up the energy company, which I wanted to set up really badly because a perfect building for it. And then, but you can imagine, we attracted a lot of uh, other companies. Because I'm not, uh, I, you know, I'm not uh, against commercial development. As long as I can stay, it's okay. Because I can benefit from them, and they can benefit from me. Because I can work from them, or I can just help them with uh, designing their interior, or whatever. 
So I, um, it was uh, to MTV moved there, the headquarters of Greenpeace moved there, Pinot Ricard, Red Bull, uh, Viacom Discovery Channel, all these big headquarters have moved to the MBSA Morph. And, and the MBSA Morph is quite big, it's 150,000 square meter. And not so much on our, on our side, but more on the other side. And after a few, uh, we also have a, an, an energy, uh, a, a boat, uh, which is, is self-sufficient on energy, and we have lectures there about sustainability. And we met our neighbors, and then suddenly a few of our neighbors were also very interested in developing the most sustainable business districts in the Netherlands. So we joined together and we set up an energy company called NESN Energy. And we've now been, we exist now for two years, and we're now in the top 10 of energy companies in the Netherlands, which is working very well. And I'm like really poor, I can only pay a share of 50 euros. And the other company has like a lot of people who invest 20,000 euros. We have the same both. So it's, you know, it's not about how much you bring in, it's like equal votes, etc. But anyway, like if you go, we go too. So that's also a nice development which is happening now at the moment. And um, so we're now setting up this self-made future um, because the, the development is not working, like the waterfront development. Only 20% of the waterfront plants has been developed. And the companies there, they really like us. The skate park has been evicted last year, much to our anger and false and um, and um, yeah I mean, that was horrible and um, but we were building a new skate park I'm building a new skate park now with companies not with not with authority not with the city anymore but just with our sponsors like Nike Red Bull they really have a, a common interest in skateboarding so we have a good uh, new skate park we're building there and but it's still really horrible that the skate park that managed to get the money together for the first time that we actually could start a whole project. They didn't even get that much support from the artists in, who were building inside. So I cannot say I blame the government for fucking up. I also blame ourselves that it's difficult to get organized ourselves in that way. And also because um, with the, our foundation out of hands now, um, we have no say in it at all. Oh, that was a bad end there. Eh? Yeah, I want to make it up. Anyway, we are working on the self-made future now that we are getting together again. We're really trying to, uh, you know, work out. I'm back again, you know, so I didn't move, but now I feel like, okay, I'm back again and we can do it. And um, I'm now so famous in the Netherlands that uh, <laughs> I can now, you know, I can really write and talk about it. And now people are really taking it serious. So I'm working now on the energy company there. There's the restaurant there, there's the other project I did. But I'm also working in Japan on the shipyard. And I've worked in Berlin and Berlin Tempelhof, uh, activating the field with the people. So I'm getting a really big reputation. I've been asked to give the lecture every five years. That is this really big lecture someone is allowed to give. And you get a lot of press attention. And I'm going to write, I'm going to lecture about this in, in a very nice, but also in a very hard way at the end. Uh, there's a lecture that the, every five years in the last time it was the Prime Minister who was allowed to give the lecture this year to me, so I'm going to really hope that we can make it for the better. Um, yeah, thank you. That was me. Do we have some questions? Oh. How come? <laughs> Anybody involved in the squat movement? Yeah? Uh, I was involved with the initiative for social community center here in Novi Sad. Yeah. And I was uh, really uh, listening to your story very carefully. <laughs> Yeah. And now, in, at this moment, uh, I felt that the initiative is a little bit um, dissolved and the people are a little bit um, tired from all the uh, fighting for space. Or, uh, and it, it, it um, became, it, it um, 
became a little bit that uh, small collectives are gathering all around the city and working together, but these huge ideas of uh, claiming the space, uh, fighting for space is not uh, so <laughs> vivid anymore. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, it was, I, I don't know whether you are familiar with the, the story of Social Community Center, but you had this photo, uh, first photo yes, for yes, the I presentation. It. Yes, it was a huge, asked, uh, okay. yes, it was a huge movement, and for, for Navi Saad, it's something very uh, untypical, um, th this kind of uh, social movement, and the um, people who wanted to, to get uh, into place and make something, create <laughs> something. So it was like, um, social process, but it had uh, so many agendas because different people were involved and uh, nobody um, articulated their, their aim, what was the purpose of getting into, into uh, yeah. this particular military barrack yeah. place. <coughs> so one, uh, there was like symbolic way of uh, demilitarization of um, society, then it was claimed a space for artists, that it was a claim that we need like um, to preserve the heritage monument, uh, the building which, which is a part of uh, <coughs> cultural heritage. Then it was, it, there were lots of different agendas and it, it, it didn't succeed, but uh, I'm thinking that maybe it's not the, um, maybe it's not the moment or it's not the way for this uh, society here. So it's it just my... A process uh, of talking <coughs> about uh, everything began with one short movie yeah. uh, about military barracks in Slovenia, uh, Croatia, and how they uh, re regained the, uh, gain uh, purpose for social or community centers and how they could be used for that those purposes. And people got very excited here. And uh, um, for me, it's, it was a phenomenon that a huge amount of people that didn't know each other within this small, small city gathered. Yeah. That idea get, uh, uh, brought them together. <laughs> so it was, it was uh, interesting from that point of view. So the, the meetings were, about for about, uh, were lasting for about two or three months and then it was the entrance in the military bar barracks uh, on the symbolic day of, uh, day of Yugoslav army. So, uh, former Yugoslav army. So the, the working in the, in the uh, this squat, squatted uh, military barracks was for three weeks and then uh, the collective was expelled from, from space after three weeks. And then um, the, the things that people were bringing inside, because lots of citizens were interested what is going on and they were starting to, to come uh, uh, eventually and they were bringing things, so, so all those things that were gathered were put into the uh, building that is property of the city, uh, city of Novi Sad, and now it is still a place, squatted place, and they uh, managed to get the permission to work there, so it is still called a uh, social center, but it is not the initial movement that was, those are not the people who, who gathered initially. So uh, altogether it, it lasted uh, like three weeks with all, with all the programs and so on, then the, the movement was expelled. The, move, the people. Sorry? Uh, for the, uh, at the beginning there were maybe 50 people and then uh, on the day, uh, within those two or three months of meetings, there, there were, was uh, maybe 200 people who were coming to the meetings negotiating, and on the day of entrance into the barracks, there was maybe 300 people. So, but lots of people were just going around, seeing what's going on, but it was no, um, I'm not an artist, so I, I didn't uh, need a space or something. I was just looking at the initiative and I was interested in the phenomenon and I wanted to contribute with my knowledge or something. But people were not um, so, how can I say, they, they are artists and collectives, they were claiming the need, oh, we need space, we don't have a place to exhibit, but they were not putting some, uh, that's my, now, now my, my uh, view that they were not maybe uh, persistent enough to, to uh, make agenda and to claim the, the space or to, to make some kind of... Uh, I don't know at the moment, but it's very, very big. I don't know, maybe, maybe some of the architects know some here from Novi Sad. It's a huge building. It's, it's not... Um, I don't know, but it's huge. It doesn't mean anything. Okay. I don't know... Uh, okay. 
Kasar na doktora Čibald Rajs na futoškom putu. Možete li biti mnogo od 30 ljudi? Možete li biti mnogo od 30 ljudi? Možete li biti mnogo od 500 ljudi? Možete li biti mnogo od 500 ljudi? So, but but that is the uh, this that mo moment uh, brought this value that people uh, get got to know each other better, and it's just one one uh, point in the history it of Novi Sad. So time to know each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It takes years. People come, people. I also started with a group, and you know, with a group, and, and, and some people left because it was not really their thing. And, it's like you know, people come and go. Yeah, and then, it's the and then it's after a few years, there's this core group, and they can they finally have their mind set up to do to what they want. That's a normal process. I'm wondering if, if you could imagine yourself in a in a city of Novi Sad, for example, when there's actually no huge, both no huge enemies, but no also no huge initiatives. So. Everything is a bit calm, and yeah, people are like, we could do something, but then government is also, well, we don't, we are not sure if we want to support. So everything is really lo-fi, you know, no, no heat, no energy. What would you, what you, what would be your first moves to heat it up? <laughs> You know, like I had to fight for it because Amsterdam is a very small, compact. Everybody wants to live in Amsterdam. It's very hard to get in. But if it's nice, sort of quiet. Everybody knows each other. You know, 300,000 people here. I can imagine setting up something like that. But yeah, you do have to take time. But I also, it's also important to have certain history to have it, sort of roots in the place. You know, it's like, and I also demand, you cannot start something if there's no demand for it. You know, of course, I, could, I don't know what, what, what I would do here, but if I want to create something, space, or I want to have more room, you know, then it's my business to do so, and uh, it's my own process. I take responsibility for my own process, and I try to get people, of course, I, like, I really like to work with people together. But it can only work if people feel, feel that they have the same need that they have a vested interest in, in, a, in a building or in a place or a venue or an event. And it's also, I, I believe everything is also, like what you do, it's not like you're going to earn lots of money with it, but it is an investment in yourself. That's what I believe. And um, <coughs> there were so many people on the street, there was no affordable working space. You can imagine, we had, we had two, we, we could have five warehouses filled with these people. So if there is not a, a big demand here... But do you think that the building comes first as some kind of provision or is the community? Well, it depends. I like to do stuff in really kinky buildings. You know, like far out, out big, uh, this, that's, that, that's attractive for me. You know, and especially if it's somewhere on the river, and where you can, now there's boats going all the time, and uh, yeah, I would, uh, that's what, that's the place where I would put my money in. You know, I would not put it in a flat somewhere far off where there's no identity. I think, yeah, but uh, you could maybe think the other way around. Would you like that much more? The only thing is what I really hate, that what we started was unplanned and spontaneous. And now, I don't know if you're acquainted with Richard Florida, most people aren't anymore, but some. After Richard Florida, this whole bottom up spontaneous development became an instrument for gentrification, like me entering the competition. What was I thinking? You know, of course, I'm being used to gentrify the area, but I thought, I'm going to have the city as a framework model, we're going to stay there if we can buy it forever, and if we stay there for 25 years, I'm going to show the world that it's possible. I want to have sustainable investments, like long-term development. And uh, it's crazy that 
to manage to find so many people with hardly any, you know, very problematic income, to put all their savings and energy and free time into building. I capitalize labor as well, eh? like, you know, it's not only, uh, so I, 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 you know, if you ask someone to build it for you, you can pay more when you build it yourself. <laughs> Do you see yourself as a trend watcher some, in some way? No, not at all. <laughs> because you've been scouting buildings and like you went from one building to the other and somehow you have an, you have an eye because of your passion for kinky buildings, as you put it. Uh, you have an eye for, for, for what actually might become uh, popular. And maybe that's also where kind of... Actually, I felt, I felt very much drawback when I was growing up. Um, yeah, after I was in hospital and I came back and was in university, I felt very uncomfortable um, being part of society. So these areas, these sort of far away, obscure areas where people would come and would leave me alone and I could be shy and sort of do like, you know, like this. And, and, and there were also people there that didn't fit into society. And that attracted me more. Of course, in the building, yeah, in the beginning, yeah, I don't know, it's, they were just empty and beautiful. And I have this history of art projects as well on railway stations and empty factories and mega theaters. So I grew up in England, which there was all these ghost houses and empty. So it's something in my nature. It's not, uh, but I'm not a trend watcher. I'm 20 years always late in fashion. I think I have this very authentic passion for doing things, and I, I'm, I'm, with me it all goes naturally. I didn't choose to be to do this; it just uh, overcomes. But I have a lot of experience already in these buildings and how groups work and how communities work, how fights go, and and I can I cannot tell you how to do it. I can tell you how to do it. I know exactly how to do it, but it won't help. You have to find out yourself. I can only um, just be a sparring partner. But it, like I know exactly like how how to organize our, 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 our my own artist friends, but they will not get told by me. No way. <laughs> so they have to find out themselves. And now, after I let, I stopped. You know, I went to do other stuff in 2008. Now they come back and say, yes, you should organize it like that. So that, it proves that we need to incubate first together. And now they say, yes, we should divide ourselves in five different organizations. It's not working. And now, now it's working, I hope. But a trend watcher. Are you a trend watcher? <laughs> But I may have this paranormal, you know, paranormal gifts. <laughs> <laughs> okay, do we have more questions for Eva? Did you like it? Yes. Yes? yes. Did you hate it? <laughs> Nobody? No? Could you imagine yourself <laughs> doing it? Because I really hope that I inspire you. Like, if I can do it, really, you can do it too. Because I was so shy, etc. after the Alps. <coughs> Does anybody think you can do it? How old were you when you started this project? Uh, 32. What's going on actually at this moment? At the warehouse, no. yeah. We are regrouping. We are group regrouping ourselves. And so if we have more people, parties in the neighborhood helping us out. We set up an outdoor foundation, writing a book. We're trying to get rid of our manager. That's sort of our, our biggest aim, which we will succeed in. And uh, I have still. Uh, I still trust the, the happy ending, strange enough, and I've learned a lot from it, even though it's a horrible story, 
skatepark is a really big deal, the art contracts end next year. But uh, we're not going to go down with a good fight. Maybe we'll. Thank you. Well, thank, thank you for you. having me here.